So hello and welcome back, and this is going to be continuation of our Northern California series, mostly around BART and the creation of it. And today we're this is going to be kind of a mini documentary that's going to be going over the history of the various interurban railways that used to serve the Bay Area and in general uh, Northern California. And this was eventually going to was originally supposed to be a series of smaller videos, but due to a case of the Rona, I uh, lost a whole week of work, so this is just going to be one either normal length video or, or slightly longer than normal length video. And we'll be more or less going to be going from the northern end of the Bay Area to the southern end and out into the uh, further afield guys owned by the Western Pacific. So this is um, going to be the outline of what we're going to be talking about today. We'll be talking about what is an interurban railway, the Petaluma and Santa Rosa Railroad, the Northwestern Pacific's interurban operations. We will not be doing the non-electrified steam and diesel powered um, parts of the NWP that went further north of Marin County. The Peninsular System, which is South Bay, East Bay Electric, East Bay Key System, also East Bay, and then the Sacramento Northern and the Tidewater and Southern are the two more further afield ones. And uh, the picture on screen, although not technically an interurban, is still a um, I believe it's a DMU. I don't see a power, like a, you know, overhead wire anywhere. Uh, it is a Alstom product, and this is kind of the more modern equivalent of a uh, interurban railway. Is basically just a regular train these days. Uh, there was one, there's a nice one from Japan, but I can't get a good photo of it, and this is the, the next best thing. Anyway, so what is an interurban railway? I should probably establish what that is before we actually get too far into this. An interurban railway is defined uh, by the four conditions off to the side of the picture of the North Shore Line. They are electrically powered, mostly they are to carry passengers. They have street running segments and they're generally heavier than streetcars. These uh, systems generally evolved at a time when roads weren't paved and large and cars largely didn't exist, or in large numbers at least. I mean, there were definitely cars but, uh, when they hit their heyday between the nineteen hundred, early like 1900s and the mid-1920s before the Depression. And the interurbans were actually generally killed off more by the Depression and than they were cars, and they were all largely gone by World War II, with a few of them that did kick around until the 1950s. And some systems started off as dedicated lines between towns and cities in a small geographic area. Some of them started out as streetcar systems that just kept growing, and many were started as a keystone of land development plans. And this is uh, interurbans in general around the United States, not just in the Bay Area. We're not into the Bay Area specifics, it's just the in general overview, um, in general part of the, uh, part of the video, because I'm sure there's some interurban, out, interurban railway out there that had like a gas-driven motor car that ran like five miles somewhere along the line that no one really cares about except for people who live near it. As was mentioned in a past video and will come up in this section about the key system, most streetcars and later interurban systems were started by companies trying to develop land. They would build a line along a road where they wanted a neighborhood to develop or between towns, you know, in an area where they wanted it to, to develop and um, development would ensue. Anyways, we're going to first start with the Petaluma and Santa Rosa Railway, largely going in that like north to south to east circle. The Petaluma and Santa Rosa Railway was created with the merger of the Santa Rosa Street Railway, the Union Street Railway of Santa Rosa, the Petaluma Street Railway, and the Central Street Railway in 1903. They were merged into one. The problem was is linking Santa Rosa proper to Petaluma didn't exist. And one would need to be built over one of the predecessor railroads, which was the end of, to the NWP. And on January 3rd, 1905, they attempted to build a crossing over the steam line that was the NWP that would connect the two sides of the Petaluma and Santa Rosa system. Sorry, excuse me, I think I might have made that unclear. As technically, there was somewhat of a connection north to south, but not into Santa Rosa proper with their uh, streetcar system. And the Northwestern, actually I think it was the California Northwestern Railway at this point. The NWP didn't exist for a few, like a good decade at this point. They parked two steam engines at the location of the crossing, and then they sprayed the crews with hot steam and water. The next day, the Petaluma and Santa Rosa built a crossing under the nose of them and hauled a horse-drawn car over the railway. To which the, uh, we'll, we'll just use NWP for short. It basically just became the NWP. I'm not going to... 
um, nitpick on that one. The NWP quickly got an injunction from a probably corrupt judge in San Francisco that prevented the Petaluma and Santa Rosa from operating into Santa Rosa until March 1st. On March 1st, the injunction was dissolved and the Petaluma and Santa Rosa Railroad was allowed to build the crossing. The problem was is the either is the NWP either didn't know or didn't care that this had happened and did the same thing to stop the work crews by just spraying them with water. And they were also backed up by 150 waterfront thugs from San Francisco. This led to the scuffle that Santa Rosa residents came out to watch, which was eventually put down by local police. And after, and this is um, to build just this just this little bit here and in, into Santa Rosa proper. There was like a streetcar system here that was consolidated, and they needed to build this line. Anyways, um, in 1905, the line was extended north from Sebastopol here up into Forestville, and eventually did make it to a place called Trenton. And there were other plans to extend the system. One included one south into San Rafael, which would have been, I think, believe it would be like basically the bottom of this map. I kind of cut this map down to size a little bit to better um, show it to you guys. Along with a northern extension from here to Geyserville and Hilt, which is actually north of Hildsburg a bit. As long as an extension to Two Rock, which I don't know if is on this map. This map might be too old, but that eventually did get built. It's somewhere out here where the cursor is. And they eventually wanted to build it out here to Tomales Bay and Bodega Bay, like into this area out here. And along with a potential extension over into Napa. All of these extensions were put on hold once the 1906 earthquake happened, and it wouldn't be until 1913 that the extension to Two Rock would be completed. And by this time, the NWP was nearing completion to Eureka and had the full backing of the Southern Pacific and the Santa Fe. This just here is um, one of their wooden, I, th I think it's one of their streetcars. I'm not sure if it's a streetcar or an urban car. I'm not 100% sure on that. But the uh, railroad did start to decline going into 1925, which is in line with the pattern of inner urbans as an industry. Passenger service on the Two Rock branch was discontinued with declines mounting. The uh, Petaluma and Santa Rosa sold itself to its old rival, the Northwestern Pacific. At this point, the system was starting to get dismantled fairly quickly. Trolley service across the system ended on July 1st, 1932 with passenger ferry service ending in 1935 and freight service continued out of, I'm guessing, Petaluma until 1940 when one of the ferries was scrapped and the ferry Petaluma, which was the last remaining ferry, made its last run in 1950. Following the war, the remains of the system was slowly dismantled with the two rock branch being gone in 1952 and the line between Santa Rosa and Sebastopol being closed and the parallel NWP line be being retained. And electric operations ended in 1947 after the motors were lost in a fire in Sacramento. And by 1980, the only remaining portions of the railroad were around Petaluma for industrial customers. And there have been efforts by volunteers to restore trolley service along the Petaluma waterfront. So the neighboring Northwestern Pacific also ran its own interurban service that was partially inherited from some of the predecessor railroads to the NWP proper. And this operation started in 1903 and continued until 1941, just within Marin County, or at least largely with it. No, yeah, no, this is entirely within Marin County. Also, thank you for the Greater Marin blog spot, blog, whatever. Uh, they're the people I, I nabbed the map from because this is the only one that actually shows the service patterns because it's kind of hard to follow when it's just a black lined map, especially considering they had kind of a uh, little bit more complicated service patterns. But anyways, the railway ran from Sausalito at the southern tip of Marin County to points north. This railroad, oddly enough, used third rail electrification across the whole network instead of the more common overhead wire. So over the length of the network, there was just a bare third rail just sitting next to the tracks and in some cases along streets or at least next to them. And rail in Marin has a history going back to early steam trains in the 1870s that culminated in the electrification of commuter lines in southern Marin County and the brief reign of the NWP Interurban Railway. By the time the Interurbans became proper Interurbans, you could get as far north as Ukiah by train and Tomales Bay over the North Pacific Coast Railroad, which was a narrow gauge predecessor to the NWP that eventually got absorbed into it. And when the route was first electrified, the lines to Mill Valley and San Anselmo, so Mill Valley here, San Anselmo up here, 
were the first to be fully electrified. And after the Southern Pacific uh, acquired the California Northwestern Railroad is when things get a little bit more interesting. This is when the full triangle service around San Rafael was completed. And this is also the time um, when the tracks, at least as far as Manor, were regaged, and the North Shore Railroad, which is what the um, North Pacific is. This it, it's really hard. I'm just going to straight out say this because this is going to come up in the NWP video. The predecessor railroads' names change quite frequently because of bankruptcies, reorganization, and probably just the general corruption of the Southern Pacific at this point in time. So it's kind of hard to keep track of all these name changes. <laughs> Either way, it was a predecessor to the Northwestern Pacific that was a narrow gauge line at one point called the North the North Shore Railway, and it changed its names a few times. But anyways, it, it created this. Anyways, 1929 would be a big year of change with the Northwestern Pacific. This is when the Santa Fe sol sold its stake off to the SP, and the SP fully controlled it and started abandoning some segments of the railroad. But this didn't include the inner urbans, though. They actually did put money into them at this point in time, which was actually kind of odd. This including adding more electrified segments and replacing the wooden cars with steel ones. And this uh, this is um, and things started going south with this railroad in 1934, which is when a wildfire in Mill Valley destroyed the connecting Mirror Woods railways that took visitors up to Mount Tamil Pius, which reduced you know ridership dramatically. And this is a full two years after they took over the Petaluma and Santa Rosa Railroad, just for comparison. And the final straw would come in 1937 with the opening of the Golden Gate Bridge, making commuting to car by commuting to San Francisco by car, excuse me, uh, the more preferred option. Anyways, and this is also just one of the electric steel cars, uh, what it looked like. Uh, I believe these cars also ended up on after they were retired from the Northwestern Pacific, were transferred to the Pacific Electric Railway in L.A., where they did live out their lives uh, traipsing around the streets of Los Angeles and um, whatever was like at the orchards and whatever was in Southern California. I don't know Southern California's history all that well. I haven't really gotten to it yet, so I'll learn that in the future. Anyways, passenger service would kick around until the 50s on the NWP as a series of trains heading to points north. Other parts of the interurban railway, at least to Sausalito, were held on to as freight lines until abandonment in 1972. And parts of the Mill Valley and San Anselmo trackage are trails now, along with some portion of the interurban mainline still being owned by Golden Gate Transit and were proposed to become a busway sometime in the 80s. And as far as I can tell, nothing has come of that yet. And the final part worth mentioning of the old interurban right away is that it's now active under smart between San Rafael and Larkspur and you know obviously smart goes as far as Santa Rosa so again that's not just where it ends but um you know again it's not an interurban technically but it's more of a normal mainline railway but anyways we'll uh, leave the NWP section there and move on so the Peninsular System it was an interurban railway system that covers the South Bay, or Silicon Valley as it is now known. It generally connected San Jose to far-flung places like Camp L, Saratoga, and Stanford. And the amalgamation of a few different railway companies was nothing short of a covert takeover of smaller railways by the Southern Pacific. The story began, begins with James W. Rhea, uh, the San Jose and Los Gatos Interurban Railway Company, selling the company to a banker named O.A. Hale in 1904. Given that the SP was essentially a mega corporation in California at that time, there were allegations that Hale was an agent of the Southern Pacific. At first, nothing was substantiated. The system kept growing as planned, and there were no suggestions that the SP were actually calling the shots. Also, this map here is actually a promotional map from the, I think, San Jose Historical Society. This is what the interurban system would have looked like at its full proposed extent. And um, I'll show you another map on the next slide in a, in a minute about um, what it would act actually, I'll just kick it over now. This is actually what the system fully looked like when it was completed, including some of Santa, including San Jose and Santa Clara's streetcar system. Anyways, uh, back to the story of the actual railway. About a year and a half later, Hale incorporated the Peninsular Railway, which was originally planned to build an interurban line from San Jose to San Francisco. And there were other proposed lines, such as a line to Oakland and, curiously, Vasona Junction, where it could connect with a Southern Pacific subsidiary that ran over the Santa Cruz Mountains to Santa Cruz. And it was clear that the older San Jose and Los Gatos would be merged into this new interurban at some point. 
And the extension to Vasona Junction was suspicious because there was no real reason to have a double tracked and urban line through it was what was at that point a bunch of orchards. I'll also make the note that this wasn't technically called Vasona Junction at the point, considering I'm again naming. I'm kind of referring to it as that being that area just for the sake of, you know, more just just so just so a more modern audience understands it. I know like someone's probably going to nitpick and say that, oh, well, it's not technically a zone of junction or it's like technically somewhere else. Generally, that area, it's like I'm just not going to go into. Uh, it's one of those I'm not going to be too technical because I need to know like people need to know where this stuff generally is if they don't aren't familiar with uh, historical names of the area. So for people who are on a nitpick over that, I just got to let you, it's one of those things like more, I'm going to Monday morning quarterback a little bit. I got to make it a little bit more accessible for people who don't necessarily know this stuff. <clears throat> Anyways, most people suspected that this would just be a, a route primarily used by SP steam trains and that the Peninsula Railroad was being used as an easy way to disperse liability, both legal and financial. And construction of this line would be finished in 1908. And to the shock of few people, no interurban tracks were installed on the on the Mayfield cutoff to Vasona Junction south of Congress Street. This new line was going to be an SP main line. And following this, the SP quickly started to regauge the line to Santa Cruz from three foot narrow gauge to standard gauge. A year later, the San Jose and Los Gatos, along with the San Jose and Santa Clara, were consolidated into the Peninsula Railroad, and it was revealed to be an SP subsidiary. And the last railroad to be mentioned um, is the San Jose streetcar system as shown on the map. Uh, and this is the full map of the consolidated South Bay interurban rail network. And as far as extensions beyond this goes, they were never completed. They, this train system never reached Oakland and never reached San Francisco. And the Colorado River flood that created the Salton Sea is the often cited reason as to why this extension, these extensions were never finished. The reason stated being that the rails would, that would have been used for the interurban lines were used to rebuild tracks in the Imperial Valley. Personally, I think the SP never intended to extend uh, the peninsula or the pin further north than it did. They already dominated the commuter market into San Francisco, and even though the Western Pacific w was wanting to build a competing line on the peninsula, it never got the financing to do it. So other than this being a defensive thing by the SP, I don't really think they were ever going to do this. And also, Oakland wasn't really a huge economic hub, so having a third or fourth, I'm not sure if it was third or fourth line at this point, connecting San Jose and Oakland just kind of seemed pointless to me considering it was also largely farmland in the area Fremont and Newark and Hayward at this point I'll also make the note that the Oakland portion was actually going to go over the Dumbarton Bridge which is still a dream for rail fans and urbanists in the Bay Area to this day and the line into San Francisco was planned to connect with the Market Street Railway in San Mateo to enable an easy connection into San Francisco proper the pin more or less didn't survive the Great Depression, so we're just going to get quickly into the decline on this one. And the railroad was struggling in the 1920s and was being scaled back, first from Stanford in 1929, and that entire branch was shut down altogether in 1934. And it wouldn't, and well, actually, 34 is when the whole system went kaput. And it wasn't for another solid 50 years that streetcars or light rail would even run again in the Silicon Valley until VT opened its first light rail line in the 80s. So again, it literally, it was like, I think like 84 or 85 is when VTA started running its first light rail services. So it was, it was literally 50 years in between the system shutting down and the first light rail lines opening up. Anyways, this is actually a picture of one of their inner urban cars on the Los Altos in San Jose. Um, this is, I don't I'm not entirely sure if they ever ran with steel cars. I couldn't find that out if they, you know, what their equipment was made out of. You know, the, the things that people record online is actually kind of weird and interesting in its own right. But again, I don't really have the time to go fully into that. Um, and also, just as a aside, I'm not really going to talk about the Market Street Railway since it was primarily a streetcar operator in San Francisco that had one inner urban line that ran to um, San Mateo. And because of this, I'm just going to stick it in as a streetcar operation and not an inner urban one due to its lack of long distance routes. And from what I can tell, it, again, it was just an overgrown streetcar system. So the next railway we're going to be talking about is the East Bay Electric, which was another Southern Pacific subsidiary that started out as a steam hauled passenger commuter service by the Central Pacific that served Oakland and Berkeley. It would exist in this form from 1863 to 1911. 
1911, the company was reorganized and electrified to fully convert the system to an inner urban system. The SP also ordered new 70-foot steel cars to replace the old equipment on the route. There were also long-term plans to extend the system north to Richmond and south to San Jose, as mentioned in the previous segment, but neither extension was ever completed, at least under them. The extension to Richmond happen, not happening is a more interesting one, to me at least. It would have made some sense given the proximity to Richmond, even, and even though it was small at the time, it wasn't as remote or unimportant as the towns between you know Oakland and San Jose at this point. Because again, at this point, Fremont, Hayward, Union City, and a few of the other cities didn't technically exist yet. They were still largely rural farm towns. Again, as urbanized as the Bay Area is today, a lot of people forget that a lot of the land was still farming at this point in time. In the, you know, we're talking like the early teens and 20s. But anyway, streetcar service was launched in Oakland to Berkeley in 1912 with equipment ordered from Pullman. At this point, the commuter trains would run to the Oakland Mole to connect to ferries across the Bay since the bridges hadn't been built yet. There were people proposing that the bridges be built, though. And the Richmond San Rafael Bridge was honestly, it was like ironically, the first to be proposed, but it was the last to be built. But this is um, how the you know the operations that would go on the East Bay Electric on the onset of the Great Depression. Commuter trains to the mole with streetcars circulating around the East Bay, uh, more or less, would continue through the Depression. And uh, due to mounting losses, though, the streetcars were, were service was killed in the early 1930s or really early into the Depression. And with the actual coming of the Bay Bridge in 1934, the East Bay Electric was reorganized into the Inner Urban Electric Rail Railway, since it, along with the key system in Sacramento Northern, would share tracks over the bridge. And this is also the time where they started building, um, they built a new maintenance yard near the bridge. And after the bridge was open, trains would run over the, the Bay Bridge to points in the East Bay. The only thing um, of note that would happen in this time was that certain lines were abandoned. In the East Bay, in coordination with the key system, um, and anywhere, so basically how this worked was anywhere the two shared trackage, one abandoned their service based on who was there first, so the late arriving one lost out on that route, and this led to the consolidation of services in the East Bay that would last until July 1941, when the interurban electric abandoned passenger operations and left the key system as the only remaining interurban in the Bay Area. Anyways, this is actually the map of the system. So it served, you know, Berkeley up here through Oakland um, into San Leandro and then around Alameda Island. So this was actually still a fairly substantial system. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't short by any means of the word. And then the key system, uh, what's it called, uh, Pier is down here. And anyways, let's just get into the key system. And thank you, I think it was this uh, segregation by design is the person who made this. Um, using this map, and we'll get into it in a little bit about as to why I'm using this map, but we'll, uh, we'll just talk about that in a minute. Basically, it's because, like, all the other maps just kind of suck, but it's, like, that's basically the long, long and short of it. Anyways, the key system was the second major transit system in the East Bay, and, as, and was, from what I can tell, generally the more extensive one, because all these, like, lighter blue lines are bus and streetcar services of just the key system, as far as I can tell. Some of them might be the interurban electric or um, East Bay electric, but I'm pretty sure most of these are uh, the, what's it called, the key system. Also, this uh, red line here is the Santa Fe line that actually is where BART runs now, at least part of it. Anyways, we're here about the key system. The key system served Berkeley and Oakland for the most part, whereas uh, the SP tended to be more towards Alameda and San Leandro, along with Oakland. And in the 1890s, Borax Smith took his fortune and turned it into a into real estate development. And the first step was buying up and consolidating a few streetcar systems in the East Bay that were independent of the SP. And after this was done, he turned to developing the land along the rail lines for profit, which, as mentioned before, is actually a pretty normal thing to do, at least in U.S. history. And this railway was the San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose Railway. Again, one of those it was going to extend to San Jose someday and never did. And the, the key system came from the stylized maps that showed the first few lines. Uh, there was a trunk line that ran out from a pier in the bay that spread out into three lines that formed loops in Berkeley, Claremont, and Oakland. And the system was named Key because it looked like a um, old key, and eventually that became the name of the system. The system expanded over time to include more lines and streetcar 
routes on top of the inner urban lines. And after the Bay Bridge opened, there was the consolidation of service with the SP. They gave up some lines, the SP gave up some lines, and the lines more or less ended up looking like this in 1938 after the bridge was opened. And during World War II, they also operated a line from Emeryville to the Kaiser Shipyards in Richmond, which was planned before the war but never got built. And from what I can tell, it wasn't really kept long after the war either, which is um, a criticism of a lot of wartime improvements from what I've managed to gather, well, um, whether it be transit or housing, is that they built it for the war and then immediately demolished it like within a year of the war ending. Um, and the same thing is true of a lot of public housing, actually, in Richmond. There was a lot more during built during World War II that like, a lot of it got demolished or abandoned immediately after the war ended. Some of it's still there, mind you, but a lot of it did end up getting uh, demolished. Anyways, uh, let's just look through a few of the pictures. So this is actually one of their uh, streetcars they had that they would have been using up until the end of World War II. And uh, this is the one that I believe is saved in the Western Railway Museum, which we'll talk about towards the end. And this is it running over the Bay Bridge. I believe that is the San Francisco side of the Bay Bridge. Just, just going to take a guess on that one. Anyways, the key system fell under the control of the GM-backed National City Lines in 1946, which was the beginning of the end of the key system. And this was the year Jay Quimby published his piece that exposed the ownership of National City Lines and what they were plotting to do, which was just, which was just to dismantle as many of the remaining streetcar and interurban networks in the U.S. that they could. But the sale was done, and National City Line started raising fares on the interurban line, cutting service and doing what they could to bustitute the remaining train services. By 1948, streetcar service was fully canceled and replaced with buses, and this was done over protests by all the city councils in the, that were served by the key system. And the Public Utilities Commission approved the modernization plan, which included another fare hike along with all the bustituting. Fare hikes on the remaining commuter lines continued. Transbay fares in 1920 were 20 cents per ride, and by 1952 they were 50 cents. Over that time, ridership dropped from 20 million per year to just under 10, and the increase fare revenue was used to replace buses and tear up tracks. And in 1958, the key system ended all remaining train services. And in 1960, the state had to form the Alameda Contra Costa Transportation District to take over what was left of their bus service, which is now known as AC Transit in this, which is, you know, the branding of it. And for further historical context, at this point in time in 1958, BART had already, begun, had already been brought into existence about a year early and was being um, planned as basically an FU to GM and National City Lines for tearing up the rail network. And even though the key system would be gone by 1962 when BART was approved, um, the counties of San Francisco, Alameda, and Contra Costa still did approve the first bonds to get BART construction started. And for that history, please see the previous video. Uh, that's the This is the follow-up background <laughs> history of the, uh, what's it called, um, system or idea of, or just, just transit in general the bay area i don't really have a nicer way to put that so the sacramento northern was one of at least two rail, interurban railroads that were owned by the western pacific and this railroad was formed by formed by merging two other interurban railroads together this being the sacramento and san francisco railway which was the southern end and the northern electric which is the northern end the northern electric as shown by this chunk of the map was built between Sacramento and Chico from 1904 to 1905, and the railroad went under organization into the Sacramento Northern in 1914, and the Western Pacific bought the company in 1922, and its other um, interurban holdings aside from the Tidewater and Southern were eventually consolidated into the Sacramento Northern. But before the Western Pacific bought out the North, uh, the Northern Electric or the Sacramento Northern, it created a bunch of branch lines around Northern California. The main line reached Hamilton, which was just north of Chico, by 1907. And in the summer of 1912, the Sacramento to Woodland branch was completed, and the Yuba City to Calusa branch was completed a year later. And in the end, the Northern Ele the Northern Electric Railroad operated over 93 miles of track which would form the, um, you know, the, one of the backbones of the Sacramento Northern in later years. In 
Anyways, this is the southern end of the Sacramento Northern Railway, which was built as the Sacramento and San Francisco Railroad. The railroad started out near Bay Point, which is east of Oakland in Contra Costa County. And for whatever reason, the website that talks about this says that's near Oakland, even though they're like 25-ish miles apart. I don't really know who thinks that's a good descriptor saying, oh, that's near Oakland, even though it's like, oh, it's not anywhere near Oakland. Again, I live here, so it's like I kind of have more of the geographic perspective. But again, it's, it's kind of weird to be like, oh, yeah, that's near San Francisco. And it's like, oh, it's Fresno. It's like it's, it's in California is probably just as descriptive, frankly. But again, my ranting about that over. Anyways, over the next three years of the um, what's it called? The Sacramento and San Francisco Railroad. They would build from its interchange point with the Santa Fe around Port Chicago to the key system pier in Oakland, and eventually all the way to Sacramento via a car float across the bay. And branch lines would include a line to Danville, Pittsburgh, and Vacaville. So Danville down here, Vacaville up here, and Pittsburgh is down here. Anyways, the Western Pacific bought the Sacramento and San Francisco because it wanted a connection into Oakland, which I didn't know this until I did the research for this video, but the connection into Oakland that I mostly associate with the Western Pacific that comes from the South, like over Sinal Grade and up, wouldn't be completed until I think sometime it's at some point in the 40s or before World War II maybe, but I, I, I we'll get into that in a second. Anyways, the Western Pacific bought the company out and reorganized it into the Sacramento Northern in 1927, and it wouldn't be long before the shedding of trackage started. And the first thing to go was the Danville branches and the Vacaville branches, with a line to Pittsburgh being dismantled after World War II. And the main cut came in 1957, which again is sometime after the Western Pacific built its own main line into Oakland. But the line west of... Lafayette, or at least Walnut Creek, was fully dismantled. And I believe the entire line um, south of the bay here, which is this little break here, I believe was totally shut down when BART construction started in the 60s, at least uh, this East Bay portion of it. But at its peak, the Sacramento Northern operated over 183 miles of track with two separate power systems. So the north of the bay used third rail power, which again is kind of weird given... Um, you know, power systems in the U.S. and the southern part was overhead wire. And they had planned to build a bridge across at Bay Point, but due to the Depression, they never finished it. And the decline of the Sacramento Northern was largely traced to the Southern Pacific being able to provide faster and better service around Northern California and the inevitable paving of highways as time went on. And one of the main things that honestly killed a lot of the interurban railways was paving highways in the 30s. There was an old saying in Northern California before the Depression, which was, our roads are not passable, they're hardly jackassable. And as roads became more reliable, you know, urbans declined swiftly. And this is um, was very much a phenomena that existed before um, the creation of the interstate highways, because at this point, a lot of the road pre-1940, a lot of the roads were very primitive, they were dirt, they were unreliable, especially when it rained. And generally, at least outside of towns, they weren't really extensively paved. And as I said, most of the interurban systems would be gone by the time of the interstate highways. And I believe that, and this is also generally before the whole um, GM bus conspiracy too, as well. Anyways, at its peak, the Sacramento Northern operated three weekday round trips between Chico and Sa San Francisco, with one daily round trip between San Francisco and Sacramento, and three daily round trips between San Francisco and Concord. They also had a first-class operation similar to the Oregon Electric Railway, where they ran with parlor cars and full dining service, at least on their longer-distance routes. And the trains between San Francisco and Chico would take just short of six hours and complete a one-way trip, and the travel time to Sacramento was also just under three hours. For comparison, the, t the time it takes the Capital Corridor to get to San Jose from Sacramento is three hours. And again, you're, you're going to San Jose, not just San Francisco. And passenger service along the Sacramento Northern was fully abandoned before World War II. Anyways, this is probably the most famous picture of the Sacramento Northern, which is the, the steeple cab here hauling a bunch of boxcars. 
I'm not 100% sure where this is, but I think it's in Sacramento or Chico. I'm not really sure. It might be Oakland, too. Again, some of these older pictures, it's kind of hard to tell because, again, California is a lot more agricultural than industrial, so it's kind of hard to tell where exactly this was. But given the style of the car is probably sometime in the 50s, it wouldn't surprise me if this is north of Sacramento because uh, the electric operations continued there a lot later. As you can see here, this is, I believe, somewhere in Sacramento. You have the... California Zephyr, which I believe this is one of the early runs of it, like in 1949, I believe is the first year it ran. And you can see it's going under the overhead wiring with the steeple cab Sacramento Northern locomotives just sitting here doing its thing. So yeah, the California Zephyr and the Sacramento Northern as an electric railway still, um, I guess they were contemporaries of each other, even though the inner urban was a lot older. And uh, this is one of the um, inner urban coaches from Sacramento Northern. I found this on, oh God, one of the Contra Costa County city historical websites. Anyways, this is what they look like. And the last uh, inner urban that I'm gonna talk about today is the Tidewater and Southern. And it also started out like the Northern Electric. It was meant to connect Stockton to Los Angeles as an inner urban railway. At least that was the dream. But due to reasons, it never made it anywhere near that far south. And this is going to be a lot shorter and just more of a just tacked on and just talked about just a little bit more than the Market Street Railway because I kind of just got to stick it somewhere, people would probably ask. It was constructed from 1911 to 1912, at least the Stockton to Modesto portion, and the railroad initially started out as being steam-powered and would be electrified over the next year with 1,200-volt DC overhead power. And after electric um, electrification, pasture service was established, and it ran every other hour. And by 1917, the line had extended to its southern termini of Hillmar and, Til and Turlock, which is down here. And this is around the time the Western Pacific took full control of the Tidewater and Southern, and there were plans to extend it south from Hillmar to Fresno and eventually to Los Angeles. But due to financial reasons and just the general decline of um, interurban railways, that would have been... At this point, the interurbans were at their peak, so they were kind of... People were kind of like not willing to put more money into them. But as time went on, and by 1932, passenger services would be abandoned on the Tidewater and Southern, making it a fully freight-only operation. And to this day, the Tidewater and Southern actually has the highest percentage of trackage still in operation with the Union Pacific of an interurban railway. And actually, there are still these shots of the uh, Tidewater and Southern, or at least locomotives painted with Tidewater and Southern on the side running because at one point it was de-energized and became a diesel hauled railway and it also basically existed as a paper railroad at some point in its history after it was de-energized same thing with the sacramento northern ones it was de-energized they there was like a couple locomotives running around with that are painted tidewater and southern or sacramento northern in western pacific paint but largely at this point, it was just Western Pacific operation. Uh, the reason why they didn't fully consolidate them earlier is because they got higher interchange fares for it, for using the inner urbans into a regular railway. And the Western Pacific always needed the money, which is actually the main reasons why they bought up all these inner urbans, was they needed the traffic. Anyways, the last thing, a uh, part of this that we're talking about is the Western Railway Museum, which is located in Rio Vista in Solano County. And this uh, museum does preserve the history of the urban lines that formerly ran in Northern California. And the museum was started by a group of friends who bought a soon to be scrapped streetcar from Oakland in 1946. And in the 60s, they decided to buy the Sacramento Northern shops near Rio Vista uh, because it's a lot of power supply. And in the 1990s, the SP, not the SP, the UP, because the UP bought the Western Pacific and the Southern Pacific, just other brief history. Um, they donated 22 miles of track to them, and they have five miles of that track restored. And this is the new visitor center that they have, that they built like, th around 2000. And also, this isn't a sponsored video. This is just me fangirling a bit. So um, if you're in the area and want to see this kind of stuff, go go up there and see it look up their website. If I remember, I'll link it in the description, but my track record on link and stuff like that is relatively bad. Like I have a discord and I half the time, I don't even link that. So I even forgot to put that slide in on, uh, on this one. So, you know, I don't even have that slide in here. So anyways, yeah, there's a discord down below. Link is probably down below. It might be not be down below. If it is, it's in one of the past videos. I know that for sure. Um, 
But yeah, anyways, I hope you did enjoy this like very long and rambly, ranty history through the Bay Area and Northern California's lost history um, on the inner urbans. If you ever want to harass me, the only place to do it is either in the comments or on the Discord. So uh, yeah, I hope you did enjoy, and I will see you in the next one where I think it is just going to be me ranting about uh, public transportation in California. At least that's what I have planned uh, due to it being the summer, me heading back to hopefully working in a school and um, catching coronavirus for a week kind of kind of threw my workflow off. So whatever gets done gets done. And um, I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Hope you did enjoy. Do the like, share, subscribe, commenting thing. Bother me on Discord. And uh, hope you do enjoy, and I'll see you later.